Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the show Common Sense. It's election season here in Brockton and on November 4th there'll be a number of candidates running for office. Today we have the privilege of having John Cruz in the studio. John, great to see you. Thank you, Tom. The pleasure is all mine. John, you're running for state rep. I am. And uh, tell us what area that uh, pertains in this election for you. Well, it's uh, Precinct 1 of East Bridgewater, all of West Bridgewater, and uh, about a third of the city of Brockton, all of Ward 6, uh, Ward 5, Precincts B, C, and D, uh, uh, Ward 4, C, and D. So it's, it's a lot it's of territory. Few, uh, yeah, it's a lot of territory. And actually, those are very uh, busy voter precincts. In they Brockton. are. They are. Yeah, high populations. Yeah, we've knocked on a lot of doors, and I've met a lot of the voters out there. I've got uh, quite a bit of positive feedback from them. How much uh, rubber have you lost on the bottom of your shoes? Lately? Yeah, I'm still on my first pair, but it's, it's a lot of walking. It's yeah. a lot of But I'll tell you, I, I enjoy it. I really do. I like meeting the voter out there. I like to hear and exchange the concerns that they have, and I'll tell them my, my ideas of what I think I can do for them and what I will do for them. Um, you served in this position some years back. Yes. I, uh, actually, I ran back in 1990, and I won. Uh, it was quite a race at the time, the election. It was uh, turbulent times back in the late 80s, early 90s. I ran and I was... Well, it was a big... That, that was the first foreclosure boom that I was a part yeah. of because mm -hmm. I just got out of law school and I came back to Brockton and I'm saying to myself, what the heck are all these boarded up properties yeah. doing? Yeah, well, that's... We had the, the, late flip, 80s, the early flipping 90s. of the properties in the bank. I think one of the banks from New York, they So, they so this was history paper. repeating itself not too long ago in terms that's of... That's true. This that's is sort of the second cycle of this stuff. 25 years later. Yeah, yeah. But things are, things are a little bit different now as, as opposed to then safeguards in terms of uh, property values and, and taxes and all that. But the, on the campaign trail, I, I, as, I, as I talk to the voter, I, ask them, I, I tell them I'm, I'm a former state representative when I was there back in, in the 90s, and I ask them if they're familiar what the state government was like back then, i.e. the budget or, or people in the state, and they're, they're not too familiar. So I, I fill them in. I, I let them know back then there was about 6 million people in the state, and we had a budget of approximately $9.7 billion. And I say, fast forward to today, what do you think we have? And they're like, well, I, uh, maybe the same amount of people, a little bit more in the budget. I said, yeah, well, we have 6.6 .6 6 million people, a 10% increase, but they've quadrupled the spending up on Beacon Hill. It's almost $37 billion. And I asked them, is, tell me, has your income quadrupled in the past 22 years? And of course, you can understand the reactions that I, that I received from these people. And, I, and they asked me, well, how, why is that? Why is well, that? That's a good question, John. Why is that? Ex Ex There's a question for you. You're running for, this, for the position. Why is that? Because that's why I'm running, Tom. I'm running because Beacon Hill is broken. I mean, if they quadruple the expenditures in, in 22 years, what's it going to be like 10 years from now? I mean, I'm tired of the excessive spending and taxes. Well, we'll get into there. that. We'll get into that. What's it going to be like <laughs> if the gas tax remains the same, right? We'll talk about that in, we'll a, little, that. in a little. Yeah, that's an issue. But yeah. that's a point that you have to take into consideration. Why is it that government, whenever they need more money, they keep on coming back to our pockets? And all it does, Tom, it just decreases, decreases our standard of living. I mean, we have to give more money to support a bigger, bloated government. And I'm opposed to that. I think we can do more with less government. I mean, we have to look back to what we did 22 years ago, with similar amount of people in the state, and go accordingly. Uh, you know, the state, there's been years when they have 4, 5, 6 percent growth, growth. I think we should look at it, maybe we should cap spending according to the consumer price index. Maybe we should cap it at 2 percent or 3 percent or, or whatever, the, whatever the CPI is for that particular year. I mean, we have to curb growth. That's where we are right now. That's why we have these budgets that are, that are out of proportion. Well, I mean, why don't we first start about who you are? So a lot of people know you, but some people don't know you. Okay. So tell us about who is John Cruz. Give us a little bit about your background. Well, my name is John Cruz. I was, I was born in Brockton, um, raised in West Bridgewater. I'm a lifetime resident of West Bridgewater. I went to the school system. I'm currently um, I'm on the fire department for over 30 years. Uh, I'm chairman of my board of health. I'm uh, vice chair of my housing authority. And I own my own plumbing business. You know, I, I don't work in the... Uh, in the public sector, I, I, live, I work in the dreaded private sector. I mean, that's, that's my life. I, I enjoy it. I, I, it's, been, it's been good to me, and that's, that's why I'm, I want to make sure that it's good for people in the future. That's why we have to look at where government can go, because quite frankly, I'm tired of what's going on. And this, the campaign this year, it's, just, it's, it's affecting my, you know, my, the way that I do work, because this is important right now. And people say, well, how can you do both? And it's, it's a point where we have to do better. We have to, we have to do better. We can't continue to move forward in terms of spe excessive spending, and that's why I'm running. I mean, it's, it's, it's affecting my business to some degree, but then again, I'm, I mean, I'm more concerned about the future of, of the state and, and my, ch my child. So when you, um, when you were saying that you spoke to people on the campaign trail and you 
mentioned to them, you know, that the budget back when you were serving originally yeah. was around nine billion dollars. Nine point seven. Huh? Okay, let's call it ten. Let's 10. round off to mm -hmm. ten billion. Um, what would you say the difference in terms of the size of government was back then compared to today? Well, the work public. Well, yeah, the workforce. It's, it's, the, it's, well, just in the past the past seven years alone, they've increased by approximately ten thousand people. So now it's a workforce of in excess of 100,000 people in, in working for the state right there. That's a, that's a huge issue. Um, do we need it? I don't think so. That's why when I get in, I'm going to look over every line item of the budget and compare between now and go back every few years to see why we've increased. You know, what's amazing that is that, um, you know, in some respects, you know, people who advocate for the other side say that, you know, government needs to be bigger, government, you know, needs to do more for people. Um, you know, if you ask the average person, well, okay, is the quality of your life any better now than it was five years ago? I think people are going to say, the quality of my life is, wor I'm worse off now. I think you're going to see people saying, look at, I'm paying more for, you know, fuel. I'm paying more for groceries. You know, the cost of, you know, my health care certainly, you sure. know, uh, has gone up dramatically. All this nonsense about health care is going to go down. You're going to get more for less is bull because mm -hmm. what they're doing is you're paying more for health care and your coverage, what's being covered every it's, year is less. More, you know, more is coming out of your pocket. So, so you're paying more and you're totally getting less. I mean, so, so, you know, at the same time, government is increasing, you know, and all those people saying, well, we need it to do X, Y, and Z. You know, if you ask people locally here in Brockton about the condition of their roads, about the condition, you know, of their, again, um, lifestyle. I think people are going to say, you know what, five years ago I was probably better off. Well, state government has expanded, but how about local government? How about Oh, I think it's, contra I think it's contracted. Water? Local government, I think, is contracted. Especially since they've cut our local aid in excess of $600 million over the past seven years. Yeah. Now, we had, a, we had an administration in there that seven years ago, eight years ago, said that they were going to cut our property taxes. Huh. That never that, happened. That but what big, did they the, do? The big fallacy. That, that, but that was made, the big. That they, was the big lie. It was. It was. <laughs> it was a lie. It was a lie. It, it's what it, it was. Call it what it is. It's a lie. Yeah. I mean. But I mean, they get in there, but they make matters worse. So they didn't cut our. They didn't cut our um, our property taxes like the promise was made. They actually hurt us more. So by keep, cutting our local aid, you can keep aid. your doctor. You can yeah. keep your insurance. <laughs> yeah. Your 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 premiums are going to go down by twenty five hundred dollars. It's a big lie, you know, and, and, you know. But here's part of the problem. There's no checks and balances up on Beacon Hill. Right. There's no checks and balances. You know, you have a House oh, of Representatives. one party rule. That, it, it's absolutely. one party it's, rule. It's been like that if, for. If, if, if anyone's going to say it's the Republicans' fault in Massachusetts, that is a total fallacy. If you have an issue, it's one party rule. Mm -hmm. Here's the difference. You I know. mean, there's, there's 160 House seats. I'm, I'm running for one seat. I believe there's 100 and, uh, I, I believe there's 33 Republicans in the, in the House. 33 Republicans, the remainder being Democrats. Yeah. And it's, it's even worse in the Senate. How many scandals have we had? How, you know, Name them. DPH, know, the, the forensic probation, scandal, forensic. Right? Probation. People, people have died. People have died. Because of the tampered... You know, the kids. And, yeah, you know, I mean, sure. Are you kidding me? But there's no, there's no accountability. Who do they have to answer to? Nobody. And they, no one they answer, holds them accountable. And if they need more money, they just continue to increase our taxes, and they take more and more out of our pocket. That's what's unfair about I, this. I was actually... Speaking with uh, Sandra Wright about this, mm -hmm. you know, only in government could you get away with this. Sure, there is no other entity, you know, organization that you could get away with being so incompetent or letting so many mistakes go on, and people, like you said, actually dying, kids actually missing. Um, murder is you know, being released. Murder is being because released of because age. of the forensic lab. Because of their age. It's, it's yeah, just you know, things I mean, like that. You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, people, you know, the, the system just expanding and expanding. No checks and balances on who's in the country, on who's signing up for all the benefits, on who's getting public housing, on who's getting welfare, on who's getting driver's licenses. I mean, it's, it goes on and on. And, and, that's you, why and you wonder why that 10 million billion dollars, I should say 10 billion, is now quadrupled. Hello. And that's why I'm running. I'm tired of what's going on. I'm I not concerned. Average, I think the average person wants someone like you. But the problem is, is that 
people get into office and they're only concerned about one thing, the next election, the next election. I'm not concerned about the next election. I'm concerned about this election. I'm concerned about making a difference. I'm con concerned about making government accountable. I'm concerned about making government transparent. So they see what's going on. Well, let's That's talk about transparency. How, what's your position on the gas tax on, on the question? So let's hear this. Let's be transparent. Well, here we go. I'm, I'm going to vote yes on the property, on the, on the gas tax. It's because, first of all, I'm opposed to the, the gas tax the way that it is right now. So when you say yes, tell the people what that means. Yes means it's going to repeal the automatic increase that currently exists because of the, the complete control of one party rule up on Beacon Hill that we currently have. It passed this year and it increased it by three, uh, three, excuse me, three cents. But here's something that people don't know. It's not just the gasoline. It's also home heating oil. So the poor person out there, the poor family that's struggling to heat their home, they heat their home, they also get hit with an increase according to the cost of living. Well, let me tell you so something. So it's, it's, it's you know, to, to fill your gas, your oil tank today, you know, it's 700 plus dollars. Oh yeah. To, you know, and when the winter comes in, I mean, today was the first cold day. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was basically, I had frost on my car this morning. Same here. You know, when you get those months where you need to fill up every three, you don't even get a month, at three weeks, Try paying, you know, seven hundred plus dollars a, a, a hit when, well, when it, you know, <laughs> locally here, you know, one of your local oil companies come knocking at the door. My my opponent, on the other hand, is wants to keep the status quo, keep it so we still have the automatic increase. And again, again, like I said, it's not just it's not just the fuel tax, the gasoline. It's also the home eating fuel, which goes up with a with the cost but, of living but increase as well. The, isn't that why we? elect people. Yes. Isn't that the role of the representative, the, the person that the people elect to basically review things when the people say we need this, we need that? Shouldn't the representative then analyze the situation, determine what's reasonable, if anything? You know, and that's to me taxation with representation. You're sure. my representative. Okay, you're going to Well, I would be accountable need. for the vote that I made. The way that it is right now, it's an automatic increase, and they could say it wasn't my fault. I say it's cowardly. It, it is, Tom. It is, it, it, it is cowardly. And how anybody can be opposed to at least give the legislature, let them do their job. Let them vote on it. If they can come up with the idea or the, the reasons why they have to vote either for or against it, let them do it. Let, but at least debate it in a fair and in, in, in formal fashion as opposed to an automatic increase. That's what's needed. We need transparency. Right now, the, the representative will say, I, I did, my hands are tied, it's my the law. My hands are tied, it's the law, exactly. So yeah. I think yeah. what we should do is at least repeal question one, and then if we do need a gas incre increase I mean, it, to, to support roads, which I don't think they, they do, because, no, because like I said, with quadruple else. spending yeah, in the yeah. past 22 because years, they're spending that money then they on can revisit else. it and make the tough vote and explain to their constituents that, hey, look, at this is what we need to do. We need an extra three cents on the gallon to take care of this road or, or whatever. But it's not just the roads that the fuel tax goes to now. It's public transportation in general. That's the thing that, that's, it's not just repairing the roads, it's transportation in general. It's expanding the T, which the governor has plans for. It's other areas. So it's not, it, don't get confused with just the gas tax repairing the roads and creating jobs. It's creating jobs, government jobs, for people in, in political positions. Right. Well, that they, you know, there was an article yesterday in the Globe which said that uh, five or 600 state jobs are being transported, uh, transferred to the union. Yes, I heard that because I heard that. Explain that to me. This morning, because... Um, there was a good uh, indication that if there is a change with respect to the um, leadership on Beacon sure. Hill, that there were a number of positions that would be eliminated. And so if you transfer those positions into union positions, union protected positions, they're untouchable. They're untouchable. I, and, and that is something that's basically was just reported today, actually, well, that I heard anyways, maybe the other day that you heard. Um, that is really outrageous. It's you know, it's basically a, a going away kiss from what I understand that the governor is but trying to do. But that's just the I mean, beginning, Tom. That's just uh, the beginning. It's 500 yeah, today for this department. It never ends. It'll be more. It'll be it'll be some commutations of life sentences that'll affect other people. But that's what's going on. There's no accountability up on Beacon Hill. That's why I'm running. I'm you not. Know. I'm not. I'm not going to follow leadership of the Democratic Party. I'm going to be my own mouthpiece up there because I want this job. I don't need it. I've got a good plumbing business. I want it. And I will make a difference up on Beacon Hill. Well, and the other thing that with respect to this gas tax that was voted in, you know, they tied it to inflation. So Exactly. So when times basically are tough on everyone else, not only are you going to be having to pay and increase your own bills, but when you go to the pump 
it's going to be more money. So it's like it's, it's a double whammy because... It's a regressive tax, but who does it hurt the most? Yeah. The, the middle class working family out there. Yeah, of And that's, that's who I'm there to protect, the middle class working family, the person that has to commute to work to, to make ends meet, to support their family. Well, even, even look, at even your, you know, your local landscaper who hires uh, people that may not, uh, you know, have degrees, but guess what? He's going to have to gas up his trucks. Yes. He's going to have to gas up his equipment. He's going to have to either not give his guys more raises or pass it on to the customer. I mean, it, it, it's the, all, it's all, the, you know, it's all a big cyclical it, circle. It, that's right. I mean, it will be passed on to the end consumer. It will be passed on through additional costs of the services that they, that they perform. But yeah, when will it end? It doesn't yeah. end. Well, it, it ends by voting for people like me that aren't afraid to open their mouth and make a, make a change up there on Beacon Hill. And that's my promise to the people in the district. I will make a difference up there. I'm not going to fall in line. I'm not going to be obedient to my, to my leadership. If I see something wrong, I'll voice my, my concern over it. And I will make a difference. That's my promise, and that's what I tell the people to, uh, of, the, of the 10th Plymouth District when I, make, when I knock on their door. I will make a difference up there. I'm not going to follow any party line. I'm not concerned about the next election. I'm concerned about now. I want to make a difference now because, you know, there's a lot of people out there hurting, Tom. There's a lot of people out there hurting. I, I think there's too many people that, when they get to Beacon Hill, seem to forget that it's our money they're spending, and they think it's their money that they're spending. But they pass it off as, oh, it's only a cup of coffee a week, or it's only, a, it's only this a, a month. That's how they pass it off. But sooner or later, that cup of coffee adds up. Well, if, if and you, it all if, adds right, up. The next you, thing if, you know... Right, well, I mean, if you, if you went down the list, property tax, excise tax, gas tax, licensing fees, um, you know, all the taxes, um, sales tax, uh, federal income tax, state income tax, guess what? It's, you're paying more yes. per year out of your pocket than you're taking in. The, you know, they all say, well, you know, this is, this is, you know, you're only paying your state this. No, add up all those other taxes and all those other fees. And then at the end of the day, realize what you're paying in taxes. Yeah. You, people would wake up and say, oh my goodness. You know? Well, hopefully they'll wake up November 4th <laughs> and realize that we need to make change up on Beacon Hill. Well, you need someone to be the adult in the room. You know what I'm saying? You, you, know, you, know, you, you need someone to basically stand up and say, wait a minute, you know, what are we doing with this money? Where is it going? Yeah. And before we even think about asking for more, let's figure out what we have and what we're doing with it. Let's what, see where why is that right unreasonable? Now. It isn't. It isn't. You know, I, I can remember back 1990 when I first walked into the, into the State House, day one. During the election, uh, the Dukakis administration said, you know, Governor Weld, you've got a $100 million shortfall. Well, a $100 million shortfall, you can, you can maneuver it when you still had $5 billion left of the fiscal year. So we get in the second week in April. It wasn't $100 million. It was $800 million. That's when the cuts had to be made. We furloughed employees. We made cuts. But cuts that we had to, because our bond rating, I don't know if you recall at the time, it was low because of the end of the 80s. We had to make the tough cuts. We had to make the tough decisions. We had to be the adults in the room. And we did it. And guess what? We survived. We strengthened. And then, unfortunately, they got to the spending appetite again, and they continued to spend and spend and spend. And that's what, that's, again, why I'm running. I mean, it's amazing that people always want to say, well, you know, we need to increase the taxes. We need to increase the taxes. Because it's easy way out. It, it is. It's the lazy, easy way out. And, you know, the vision is, wait a minute, if we make an atmosphere and an environment where people are be in, in an environment that they can thrive, more revenues will result. Sure. Because people are doing better. People are investing. People, why do you think that so many employers are holding off are basically not spending money, are not adding employees. It's all this regulation. There needs to be some regulation. I mean, there has to be. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. But when you're talking about, you know, all of these new things coming in, employers are just sitting on the sidelines because, you know, they're holding on to where they're at because they know the consequence with, you know, the changes in health care, you know, coming in are just going to be penalizing to them. Well, it's, it's also the uncertainty of the future. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. Are, are they going to increase our taxes again? How is it going to affect them individually? And they do make those conscious decisions when they, do I need another employee? Right, and if you have a business that's run by fuel, manufacturing, sure. trucking, 
you know, groceries, I mean, all these things that have a tied into fuel, transportation. I mean, with the way things are going, with, 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 with people that are always putting the brakes on development, always putting the brakes on projects with, that might generate um, and make it easier for uh, energy to be created here at home, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, they just don't care don't get it or cater to their special interests yeah. who, who, who don't want any, you know, don't want you to, you know, move that leaf or, you know, uh, you know, cut down, you know, a branch on a tree, uh, you know, for the sake of, you know, whatever. I, 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 I mean, see it as in my positions in West Bridgewater. I, I see the, I see, I see the red tape that we have, well, that some people have to face. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, but it's, it's even worse when you get state, when you get into the state government, because the state employee or the, I shouldn't say that the, they, they don't care if it takes another week or a month, but in the real world, that week or a month, that's money. That's real money. And who does it hurt? In the end run, it hurts the end consumer, the taxpayer, the one that's actually paying the bill. Yeah. And it also it hurts, you know, the people that they say they represent the working person because yeah. employers are, in, instead of giving someone a raise, they say the health care just went up. I can't give you a raise, sure. and I need you to contribute a little bit more. I'm contributing a little bit more to your health care. We need you to contribute. So any raise that they may have thought they were going to get is being eaten up through the increases in health insurance, sure. which, which we here in Massachusetts, you know, they, they tout Massachusetts as the model. But I can tell you that you know when I first started as an attorney, um, a single, a single plan was around three hundred bucks for mm -hmm. a single person. You know, now it's you know it's it's around twelve hundred. Yeah. You know, a thousand. What do you multiply for a that single by? person? Sure. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, for a family plan, it's about twenty five hundred dollars. I mean, it's it's a joke. It's it's a complete joke. Mm -hmm. And you know, a month. You know, I mean, it's it's more than a lot of people's mortgages. It is. You know? And uh, it's just amazing that you know all these things are put in place. They claim you know to help people. Well, I get news for them. It's, you know, everything is cyclical, and now they finally, they're hurting people. They're going in the wrong direction. But it's hurting the, the average middle-class family out there. Absolutely. That's, who it's, that's Absolutely. who's paying the bill. And the people are looking at their children saying, are, today, I'm not sure if my kid is going to be able to live as good a life as they, they are, you know? The kids are getting out of school, you know, with a hundred plus thousand dollars in debt out yes. of college. I mean, you know, college tuitions at a private school are fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. Yes, they don't pay that, but they pay a huge chunk of that because they'll take some offer, mm -hmm. you know, aid or this or that. But these kids are leaving school with debts that no one ever contemplated. But yet, you know, you don't hear any outcry about it. Not you yet. Know. Yeah. And well. unfortunately, they're staying at home because they can't afford to pay their college debt and and move on into an apartment of their own. There seems to be no end to it. And it won't. I think that's the next bubble to burst is the, uh, the huge um, student, loan student loans. Yeah. We'll so um, on another topic, how about, uh, how about crime? Where are you on crime and you know, supporting law enforcement? Well, obviously, I, I mean, I've got, a little bit of, <laughs> I've got a little insight into that with my brother Tim being the DA. I mean, it's just a lot of... Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> no, I, it, it, you, you, have to, you can't pander to the criminal. Unfortunately, there's a lot of liberal judges up there that now I, now I hear that they want to take away minimum mandatories and put, put it into the hands of the, of the, of the judges. Uh, is that a good idea? I, I don't think so because there's quite a few liberal judges out there that want to give people a second chance. But my, You think my, liberal judges mean, mean like providing certain uh, inmates with uh, the ability to change their gender in, with taxpayer-funded dollars? I mean, is that a good thing? giving these judges more latitude? Well, there's another two and a half million dollar. It's only, it, it, it's, only it's anecdotal stories, anecdotal stories, Tom. That's what you're talking about right now. That's what the governor says. That's it's what only, they all say. It's this only two and a half million dollars for sex reassignment surgery. It's right? only two That's and a right. half million there. But it all adds up. And when they don't have enough, they continue to come back to us. But crime obviously is an issue. And that's something that I want to talk about in Brockton. I mean, because of the cuts in local aid, it impacts us in terms of hiring of the, 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 the amount of police officers that we need to patrol the streets. I mean, a comparable city, to, to Brockton, we should have an additional 70, 70 to 80 police officers on the streets. We don't have that. We Brockton's need to do been something. been getting by very lean. That's right. And I, I know that there's a, there's a few state police officers that operate out of the district attorney's office that assist in the policing of the, of the city. But that's not, that's not right. We need, we need to get our fair share of officers on the streets to, to, to prevent the crimes from com being uh, committed. That's, that's the issue. But how do we do that? 
We need to get more, and that's why I'm pushing for more local aid back to the communities. That's where you see the biggest bang for your buck. That way we'll see more, more police on the streets, which in terms of should lower the amount of crimes that we have, violent crimes. I mean, we've already had, was it the 12th murder of the year so far? Well, I, I think I there's... I mean, we a, need to... There's obviously, to me, at the state level, a desire to consolidate power, meaning that they're going to control, you know, the, the pocketbook, that they can control the hiring, that they can control the jobs, that they can control, you know, basically your life and my life, and, and, and dole out things like, you know, like Big Brother. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with you. There needs to be more control at the local level. More accountability and more transparency. That's what we need in government. That's why we need, we need to get more back to our communities. The local communities know how to spend the money the right. best. And to, to show state. people what money is being spent on. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, I mean, you know, it's, 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 no, uh, it's no secret that we have a problem, you know, in the country, in Massachusetts, um, with respect to people collecting benefits that are not legal citizens. So, you know, how, you know, people years ago used to say, oh, a person who's not legal could not sign up for these benefits. They, they always used to say that. They can't. Oh, they can't sign up. Well, we, we, we saw it with, you know, the president's aunt. We see it with the president's uh, uncle. Um, I mean, if, if a, a, an amount of funding is being spent on people that are not legal, I mean, how much is it? You know, why is it allowed to go on? I mean, it's, it's more of an incentive, you know, to continue this practice. I mean, and it's less money that can be spent on, you know, cities and towns, roads, education. I mean, the whole plethora, you know, the elderly. I mean, you know, public housing, one of the first things it was supposed to be for was housing for the elderly. No, but it spiraled out of housing for everyone who has a, you know, a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, you know, this phobia, that phobia. And they guess what? They get to live and torture the elderly who are now living in those apartments sorry, as yes, well. Sir. Sure. I mean, it's a joke. But how, how can you be opposed to having a photo ID on your EBT card? Oh, I mean, you know, how can well, you be opposed to that? Crazy. Just to, to know who it is. I mean, we have a photo ID on some of our credit cards nowadays. Why shouldn't we have it on an EBT card that the people that are receiving something that we're giving to them, just to show that it is this person? And then when you have thousands of cards lost, and on top of that, I I say go one step further. I, I think you have to prove citizenship before you can. Of course, you know, I but mean, that would you know, never fly. That I mean, would never fly. In, but that's insane. That, yeah, that's where that's where the, this Commonwealth is insane. Mm -hmm. I think it's. You know, and that's why we attract so many people who are taking and not contributing. We spend billions a year, billions a year on, on this type of programs that you talk about. And there's a lot of fraud and waste and abuse that's, that's connected with it. We need, to, we need to go, I know there's a couple of representatives now up there on Beacon Hill, Republican representatives that are making a clean sweep as to, in terms of inspecting what's going on, how the process is to receive your EBT process, uh, cards, et cetera. But I mean, we, it's something as simple, just a photo ID on the card. You know, here's a quick story. I was in. Well, yeah, that's but that's insane. It, it, here's a quick story. They make you think that you're insane for. A couple of weeks ago, I was in, I was in a convenience store. in north of Boston, south of Boston, excuse me, and the the person in front of me, they got like a Coke or something, and then they got a, a Twinkie or whatever it was. So they paid with it with the EBT card, and then they reach in. And this is no lie. They reach into their pocket, pull out a twenty dollar bill, and they grab some grab some scratch tickets. And I'm seeing this, and I just. But that's not anecdotal story. I mean, I see this, it's, yeah, it, it happens time and time, time and time again. Time again. again. Yeah. I won't go when into it. I, I saw a crazy story too, but I, we don't unfortunately have time. Uh. In fact, we always run out of time when we're having fun. So we have about a minute. Okay. Uh, what would you like to say to the, to the voters of Brockton? Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce myself again. My name is John Cruz. I'm running for state representative, uh, the 10th Plymouth District, which is the east side of Boston, uh, Brockton, West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater. I'm running because I'm the only one in the race with experience. I'm a former state representative. I made the tough decisions 20 years ago and I can make the tough decisions again. I will not follow the line of my leadership. I'll make the decision that I think best, best impact the district and, and impact uh, the people of the Commonwealth. So I ask you on November 4th to give me a vote. That's John Cruz, State Representative, 10th Plymouth District. And if you'd like to get in touch with me in the meantime, you can give us a call at area code 508-588-VOTE. That's V-O-T-E. Again, that's 508 588 vote 8683 or you can get me on my website and that's John Cruz 4 number 4 rep.com that's John Cruz C R U Z 4 rep.com and I thank you for your John, time on the show John thanks for coming in thank you Tom appreciate it always fun same here